In this video, we're going to discuss the implementation of digital filters. And I don't mean what kind of software environment or issues like that. What I'm more concerned about are efficiency and using filters that have the characteristics that I really want for my application. So we're going to talk a little bit about IIR versus FIR filters. It turns out that FIR filters are used frequently as are IIR. The choice really depends on some details. We're then going to talk about the computational complexity, whether you want to uh, implement a filter in the time domain, what I mean by that is just program the difference equation, or whether you want to implement it in the frequency domain, which means using Fourier transforms. We're going to find that in many cases, frequency domain filtering, despite the uh, idea you may say, well, geez, taking all those transforms can't be that good. Uh, turns out it winds up being efficient in many cases because of the properties of the FFT. Well, let's consider the uh, IIR filter first. And what we're going to start is worrying about a time domain implementation, i.e. we're going to uh, use the difference equation. And it's pretty easy to see that um, for each output, you need P multiplies and P minus 1 additions for what I call the IIR part, and Q plus 1 and Q uh, for the FIR part. And putting these all together in terms of complexity for each output, you, the complexity is of order P plus Q. Now, even if the input is of finite duration, the output for an IIR filter is infinitely long. It's an infinite duration unit's impulse response. So the number of computations is theoretically infinite. What happens in practice is that once the last input has been passed into the filter, the succeeding calculations, the filter does produce an output, but usually it settles down after a while and then you essentially stop the computations. But that depends on a host of values uh, not the least of which are the values of the, of the A coefficients. So uh, it turns out, for all practical purposes, II filters are at an infinite computational complexity, but in practice we actually they have fewer, but that's hard to judge here. I'm going to point out, by the way, that uh, we're not going to talk much about filter design. There are, as you might expect, software programs that design these filters for you. In other words, you give it specifications of, uh, let's say you have a low pass. You want to know what the cutoff frequency is, and you give that. Um, it will uh, come back with a set of coefficients, values for P and Q, and a set of coefficients that will do the job. Um, and that um, turns out, so the filter design problem is really nothing more than running some software. There's software out there for FIR filters too. It's very different, uh, but it works very well too. What you discover is that the number of coefficients for an FIR filter to do a specific filter job is going to be more than the total number of coefficients for an IIR filter. In general, this is true, not always, but in most cases, it takes more uh, coefficients to compute the IR filter, all the Bs, than it does the sum of the A's and B's for the IR filter. But anyway, we now can compute a computational complexity because this is an FIR filter. The uh, complexity for each output is uh, order Q, and therefore if the input has a duration N, the output is going to have a duration of N plus Q. Notice that the duration of the unit sample response here it runs from 0 to Q, so the duration is Q plus 1. So using my old formula for the duration of the output is N plus the, the duration of the input plus the duration of the unit sample response minus 1. And that gets us the N plus Q. So the complexity is Q times N plus Q. Okay, so that's the complexity, and um, 
we can use this to consider whether we want to actually implement that FR filter in the frequency domain. So this brings up the issue of a frequency domain implementation. Now, we know it's true, because this is the way the mathematics works, that the DTFT of the output is equal to the DTFT of the unit sample response times the DTFT of the input. This is always true. However, as we've talked about, you actually can't compute these things because of the frequency variable f. It's, that's the stumbling block. f has an uncountably infinite number of values you'd have to compute it for, and you can never get there. So we have to use the DFT. Now, the DFT is a sampled version of these. So yk is a sampled version of the y of e to the j2 pi f. The cap these are sample version. This is a sample version, and this is a sample version. So there's some issues we need to talk about. So, but let me go through what the frequency domain implementation is. You have some input. The idea is we're going to take its DFT, obviously using the FFT algorithm, to get the uh, sampled spectrum of X. We're then going to multiply it by the sampled spectrum of the transfer function. Now, I didn't show taking the Fourier transform of the unit sample response because usually that's a fixed quantity. Um, you know what the filter is. We're just trying to run data through it. So there's usually, you don't consider in the complexity the one-time comp computation of this uh, trans sample transfer function. We're going to multiply the two together. That produces, hopefully, the sampled uh, spectrum of the output. Take the inverse DFT and finally wind up with our output. So the idea is this is our linear system, linear shift invariant system. I'll put a box around it. And what we're going to worry about is how to implement it. We're going to do it in the time domain with a difference equation, or are we going to use this frequency domain implementation. Now, can we use this implementation in the frequency domain for an IIR filter? Well, uh, by definition, the uh, unit sample response has infinite duration. To compute the DFT, I need a finite duration sample, so I can't even compute this as a Fourier transform. I can sample the formula for the transfer function, which can be derived from the difference equation to get an H of K. However, the sampling theorem still applies. Those sampled values correspond to, both correspond to an alias version of the unit sample response of the actual IIR filter. So you can't really get there. You, you can't really find anything useful using this approach. So it turns out IR filters uh, really can't be implemented in the frequency domain. That's just the way life goes. FR filters, though, I think all systems are go here. Uh, has a finite duration uh, output because little h is a finite duration. So I can find this by taking the DTFT, and everything's fine. So we're going to be off and running with this approach. We're going to talk about frequency domain implementations of FIR filters. All right. Now, here's where the subtleties come in of the uh, FIR filters. All transform links have to be the same. It makes no sense to multiply an X times a capital H where these were taken with different length transforms. Furthermore, the output is derived from a inverse DFT, so the duration uh, this transform here has to be at the same length as this one and the one that's implicit here. So the transform length, what determines it is how long the signal is. The length of the signal, you have to take a transform that's at least as long as a signal. Well, that means the longest signal is going to be the one. Well, by far and away, the one that's the longest is the output. 
And as we know, the duration of the output is the duration of the input plus the duration of the unit sample response minus one. And that means our transform length has to be bigger or equal to n plus q. So that means that this, this has duration n, this has duration q, the little h of n. That means we're going to have to pad those and take a transform at least n plus q long, which is going to be the, psi, the duration rather, of y of n. And of course, uh, n plus q may not wind up being a power of 2 for using the FFT, so we're going to pad that even with zero with zero so we can get to the next power of two. So you could be taking a fairly long transform, um, especially of H of N, in order to, to meet this requirement because N could be much bigger than Q. All right, so, but is it more efficient to go through all that work? Is it better to implement in the time domain versus the frequency domain. Now, better does not mean you get better quality results. Presumably, in today's computers, the computational accuracy will be about the same. That's not the issue. The issue is speed. Which one is faster? Now, the number of computations for a length and input in the time domain is given by this. We have n plus q output values we have to compute, and the complexity for each was 2q plus 1. The formula for the frequency domain approach is rather interesting. Um, so you see the term over here that relates to the transforms. I have two transforms I have to compute. They each have the same complexity because they have to be the same length. And so that's where 5 times n plus q log 2 of n plus q comes from. The 6 here which is just proportional to n plus q, has to do with this multiply. This is a complex multiply. Spectra are complex valued. So you have an A plus JB times a C plus JD. And you have to multiply that out. That requires four real multiplies and two additions. And that's where this 6 comes from. So the question is, which is smaller. Whichever is smaller is going to be the one that we want to choose. We do not want to choose the one that's bigger. That would mean more computations. So let's see how that works. So here I have a plot of the number of computations it takes in the time domain and in the frequency domain. N is along this axis, Q is along this axis, and you can see that the time domain, while it may be the prettier plot, turns out to be bigger than in the frequency domain for uh, all values of N, and it's only when the um, uh, filter length is less than about 20 is the time domain small. So n is not the consideration. What matters is the number of coefficients in the filter. And it turns out if the filter uh, length gets bigger than about 20 or so, it is much more efficient to do things in the frequency domain. Much, much fewer computations. So it is worth all that work in most applications to take transforms and inverse transforms. Really does make the filtering occur much more efficiently and quickly. Frequency domains are ready to go. So, I want to digress a little bit and talk a little bit about long inputs. So, suppose the input x is a million points long. Does this mean I have to take a million plus, uh, let's say, a hundred length transform of that and do all those computations at once? And the answer is no because we can use the principle of superposition. And here's the idea. Just like we did for spectrograms, I can divide up the long input into sections. Okay. I can filter each separately. 
Okay? And because the signal consists of the blue part plus the green part, they really don't overlap in time, they're at separate times, but conceptually, since it consists of the sum, I just need to add up the results. And so, what you get for an FI filter is you will might have a output which looks like this, but it's going to be longer than the input by however long the filter is. And so it will extend into the boundary of the next section. The green signal gets filtered and it produces this, which again is longer, but we now have to use superposition and in the region of what's called overlap, we have to add them up. Well, of course, there is some overlap from the previous section over here if this wasn't really the beginning of the signal. And when all is said and done, you get this beautiful output here, which looks like we filtered that entire long signal at once. We don't actually have to do that. We actually can do it uh, using uh, sections and filtering each, overlapping and adding the results. This is sometimes called the overlap add method for doing this. So, uh, you don't, you can actually process these in short pieces. This makes things run a whole lot quicker and just add them up and just be continually producing output as long as you worry about this overlap region. This is very important to get this overlap correctly. I want to talk about something else that's in this picture, and those are the dashed red curves. This input that I started with consists of a sine wave, which I show is a dashed red line with noise added. Noise is random signals, usually of a high frequency content that just sort of gets in the way and uh, makes the signal look ugly. And once I added the noise, I got the signal shown by the stem plot, um, which is very erratic, and you can barely tell there's a sine wave inside. One of the great uses of low-pass filters is to get rid of high-frequency noise, to try to remove it as much as possible. Some of the noise usually has some power in the same frequency band as the signal. You can't get rid of that, but you can certainly get rid of the, the noise, the high-frequency content, it has nothing to do with the signal. And that's what I did here. I used a low-pass filter in both these cases, and I produced a result which is given by the blue output down here. And you can see that it kind of resembles the uh, sine wave, but it doesn't quite. Like I said, that's due to the fact that some of the noise has frequency components that are close to the frequency of the sine wave. It's hard to remove those. What's more interesting, though, is why is it shifted over? Why is there, why is the peak of the input here, but the peak of the output is over here? And if you look carefully, it's about the same shift all the way across. What's causing that? The answer is, it's a linear phase shift due to the filter. The filter had to be implemented somehow, and that always produces a linear phase shift, which is very predictable. In other words, I know what that linear phase shift is. It's a property of the filter, and I understand that it's going, the output is going to look like a phase shift with respect to the input. So in some sense, I could shift back the blue ones to, if I wanted to, in order to make it look like the input, if that were ever an issue. Okay, so, implementing filters. Uh, when you go through the filter design process, like I said, it's usually true that a FIR, the IIR filter, rather, has fewer coefficient values than an FIR filter. Uh, it's hard to figure out the computational complexity of the IIR filter, but in most applications, it's probably going to be true that an IR filter is also faster. However, um, 
People tend to use FR filters in very interesting applications, in particular ones where linear phase characteristics are involved. Uh, linear phase means a pure delay. Turns out IR filters, IIR filters, cannot have a linear phase, and you'll get what's called phase distortion, which may be an issue or may not. One of the more attractive reasons, though, for using FR filters is even though they may be have more coefficient values, is that they can be implemented using the FFT. That really makes it quite interesting and attractive. Uh, that means you can get a chance to look at the signal spectrum while you're filtering in advanced applications. That might be important. Um, and so in a lot of cases, people use the FIR filter and go that way.